four of lipids and foods and today we're going to be doing an introduction to analytical methods and I realized that I haven't been spending a lot of time on food analysis. Those of the students who are taking this at Niagara College will have a, a course in food analysis with Dr. Sunan Wang in their third year but uh, in the case of fats the analytical features are incredibly important on certificates of analysis. And so if you're a food product developer, you are often selecting those certificates of analysis early on as part of your R&D cycle. You take a look at those certificates of analysis or um, technical specifications, and you, they are informing you on the, the features of this product and helping you select. In the case of fats, these, these product features are uh, perhaps disproportionately more important than some of our other uh, products. And so we'll do a brief review of some of the analytical methods that are used in fat manufacturing and product formulation because they are so um, they're so important and they're not quite as they're not quite as readily in, interpreted as they would be, let's say from a carbohydrate or protein source. So, at the end of this video, you'll be able to identify key features and certificates of analysis and review some of the analytical methods used in fat manufacturing and product formulation. So again, our friends at Richardson Oil Seed, uh, Lori Jones, have been really generous to share these slides. And we've been really uh, quite fortunate at Niagara College to have a number of different uh, fat specialists come and visit us uh, through the years, including Lori Jones at Richardson, um, Doug Chapman from uh, Chapman and Associates has been also kind to come out and visit us. Uh, and my favorite of all, uh, Dr. Yukio Kakuda, who was a fat and uh, uh, a fat scientist at the University of Guelph for many years, and he just happened to be my master's supervisor. And uh, these are all folks who have been wonderfully generous to come out and visit us at the college. So thank you to them for sharing some of this information and helping me be better at teaching you about fat chemistry. So what are the sorts of things that we're going to find on uh, technical data sheets, whether those are uh, product specifications or on uh, certificates analysis. Well, normally you are going to see product names and codes and package sizes and product descriptions and declarations. You'll see all those allergen um, codes and traceability and so on. But these properties down here are where it gets a lot more complicated. And these are unique to fats and oils and you won't see them on other products. And that's why it's worth having this conversation early on. I'm training product developers and we're teaching chemistry with a product development lens in mind. And again, understanding what's going on here, it's not just the standard microbiology and viscosity and uh, total plate count sort of stuff that you would see from some of our other classic ingredients. You will see these other things too, palette and case information, configuration dimensions, uh, lot coding, how it's expressed in this product, storage conditions. In the case of fat, you, you can't just put it at ambient. In some cases, you have to have cold chain. And in other cases, cold chain is going to be detrimental to this product and its functionality, um, shelf life, and so on. So what does this... Uh, technical specification typically look like? Well, uh, our friends at Richardson just happen to share some of these with us. And so oftentimes you're getting this shortening in a 20 kilo cube and in a 48 pallet case, and it's all lined up. There's an example label of what you're gonna see. You're gonna see free fatty acids, and then you're gonna see some of the solid fat content index. And it depends on the the uh, the tempering of that, of that fat, but, you're, uh, for example, on this one, at 10 degrees Celsius, you're going to see a solid fat content somewhere in the range of 37 to 41 percent. At 40 degrees Celsius, you'll see somewhere in the range of 10 to 13 percent solid fat content. And we have talked about solid fat content in some previous uh, slideshows, so do take the time to watch all of them. In this case, they've got a recommended storage temperature. Um, Kosher power certification, GFSI certifications, uh, in this case FS22000, and 
They have um, mass balance available. They've got a nutrition facts table so that you can plug that into your database if you're working with software such as ESHA where you may be wanting to have the very specific COHO NH uh, nutrition facts table plugged into your database. Then uh, allergen and um, allergen declaration. Uh, so is it present in the product? Is it present in other products manufactured in the same plant? And is it present in the same manufacturing plant? And depending on your risk basis, that can help you determine what sort of allergen, um, allergen monitoring and verification program you may be requiring and or what sort of allergen um, cautionary statements you may be putting on your ingredient declaration. So let's jump into what you were seeing here and dig even deeper. In a good product specification or working with the technical sales representative of a food, or food ingredient supplier, they will help you identify what is a relative application. So for example, Kovo NH is a general purpose shortening and it's palm and canola oil. But you may find in uh, different product descriptions, different applications. And good ingredient suppliers will help you build the context of what their ingredients good for and how to apply it appropriately. I realize that um, there's so much more accessibility to global ingredients. The good suppliers have that relational aspect where you can call them up and talk to them and find out more about what the, what is a good application for the ingredient. And many of the, the lower cost suppliers don't have that same relational aspect. And I can't stress this enough, there's value in that relationship, that working with your supplier is valuable. That said, if you're working with a company like Richardson, you may need to be a big supplier and you may need to be instead working with a distributor that's capable of selling you smaller quantities. Distributors are like the convenience stores of, of the ingredient industry. They will uh, have companies like, like the Richardsons of the world as their principals and then they will buy in the, the, large, uh, the large format uh, transport trucks or bulk containers of ingredient and break it down so that you can just buy perhaps uh, three or four of these cubes. Richardson doesn't want to sell you a 20 kilogram cube of fat, but a distributor totally will. Here we go, emulsified oil blend for cakes and icings. Different, uh, different applications are going to help, in the, again, the supplier will often help you identify what's the important information. Now. Now we're starting to dig into chemical and physical properties, and we'll walk through each of these um, in a moment. But free fatty acids, if you think about it, uh, we're buying triglycerides. We want those fatty acids attached to a glycerol backbone. And if they are released through hydrolysis, that decreases the stability of our fat. And so we want to have a low free fatty acid content. Um, and they're doing it on a, on an oleic acid equivalence. And so um, during the analysis methodology, this is coming off as a, as a weight-based percentage. They, they, in the analytical methodology, they have to use a standard curve, and the standard curve is going to be oleic acid. We're going to dig into the rest of these and uh, talk about them in just a moment. Because I, 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 but moisture content, you'll note it's a really, really low moisture content. So you're not going to be doing classic moisture content, we're putting that product into an oven and um, into a dry oven and exposing it to 110 degrees or 120 degrees Celsius for a period of time and then doing the gravimetric uh, comparison of the weight going in and the weight going out, you are likely going to be doing Carl Fisher titration on oil to identify the moisture content in this product because there's so low moisture content. I'm going to talk about the rest of these in just a moment here. Um, we have talked about solid fat content as well, but let's talk about Mettler dropping point or MDP value. Um, imagine inside this device, there's a capillary. It, a capillary looks like a tiny glass straw. I'm not a very good artist, but you've got this tiny glass straw and it's full of fat. And then you've got a light source shining at this. And then we're going to increase the temperature that's my thermometer. We're going to increase the temperature in a controlled way. And at a certain point, 
when we hit this temperature, that that's capillary, I was going to say straw, the oil is going to puddle out and the light is going to be able to shine right through that capillary and hit a sensor and this device is going to go ding, that's your melting point. And so honestly, um, it's, a, it's a pretty simple device to use. Mettler Toledo as a, as a equipment manufacturer has done a lot of uh, black box te technologies so that as an end user, there's very, very little that you need to do other than just prep that sample. So if you were in an oil company doing Mettler Dropping Point, you would just be loading these capillaries with fat using the operating procedure pr provided by Mettler Toledo, and you'd be loading those capillaries in, and then you'd be reading the, um, you'd be reading the device, and it would tell you, and that's it. You may have to buy some calibration um, fats that have a very discrete melting point and make sure that your equipment is uh, giving you uh, accurate reads on a routine basis. But other than that, that's it. Melting point, pretty straightforward. How about this one? This one is color. And there you can do color by good old um, spectrophotometry. But if in fat companies, let's say you were working at Richardson or uh, one of their competitors, you would likely be using a very specific color matching device called a tintometer. And in essence, you put a cuvette of that oil in and then you match the color and it reads a number for you. And so there are these standard color slides and you would just, you would flip through those standard color slides looking through, looking through that uh, eyepiece until you find the color that you think is the closest match. And so to be able to operate this tintometer, you have to make sure that you're not colorblind. That's the big thing. But uh, you're just flipping through these color slides until you find the one that's the closest match. And then when you find that closest match, you say, okay, that's, that's the slide that I want. That's the color code that I want. And that's your declaration. That's it. <laughs> Most oils are going to be orange or yellow. Some of them are red. Coconut oil can be very, very white. Um, and it's all dependent on the different carotenoids that are present within that oil. What about free fatty acids? So free fatty acids, um, historically, it would have been done by titration. And so those of you who are at Niagara College, you would have done titration with Sunan. Um, but you're titrating with um, alcohol and ether solvent and ethyl and thaline and alkali solution. And there are protocols for this. And so... This is not the protocol, but uh, this is just walking you through. What, what, why we are concerned about free fatty acids, again, as I mentioned, those free fatty acids imply that there's been hydrolysis on that fat. There's damage occurring somehow, and you want to make sure that the free fatty acid level is low in this, in this product. So high free fatty acid prevents crystallization, and it shows uh, crude processing. In some unrefined oils, like extra virgin olive oil or... Um, expeller pressed oils, you may have a higher free fatty acid and it does contribute to the flavor. So if you've, if you've been in olive oil tastings or expeller pressed oil tastings, they've got a lot more complexity and that's partly contributed by free fatty acid. Now peroxide value is going to be measuring those um, hydroperoxides. In the previous slideshow we talked about uh, uh, lipid oxidation. Hydroperoxides just happen to be oxidation byproduct and you want to get a low peroxide value oil because if it's got a high peroxide value, it means it's oxidized. And so low peroxide oil means it's fresh and it's been, um, it's not being stored for a long period of time in, in some warehouse. And it's also implying that if it has been stored, it's been stored in an optimal condition. It's perhaps been gas flushed. It's been stored away from light. It's been stored away from, uh, um, metal oxidizers, and so on. Peroxide value does increase during frying. Oh, iodine value. This is going to measure the level of unsaturation, excuse me, the level of unsaturation within your fat. And so um, it's just going to be an indication of the saturation value. So coconut oil, as we know, is very high in saturated fats, and so it's got a low iodine value, whereas soybean oil has lots of polyunsaturated fats, and as such, it's got a pretty high iodine value. 
Ooh, this one's fun. This one's called an oxygen stability index. And OSI, they're going to take a small test tube of oil, according to the manufacturer's um, operating procedure, you put that test tube of oil into this oxygen bubbling device, and it bubbles air through your oil sample and holds that oil sample at a temperature that you define within your protocol. And so what it's doing is it's measuring the conductivity. So the electrical, um, the electrical Im impedance of that oil decreases over time. The conductivity of the oil increases over time. And that's because you've got all those peroxides forming and they, are, they have partial charges and therefore able to conduct electricity. So oxidative stability index is going to be at a discrete temperature and you can see for example soybean oil has a low oxidative stability canola oil is slightly higher palm oil even higher why because it's got very little unsaturation in it olive oil is an interesting one it's got a really high oxidative stability index because it's got a lot of uh, flavonoids and polyphenols and um, vitamin E naturally occurring within it because it hasn't been purified and and so many of the naturally occurring components within oils are antioxidants naturally. Of course uh, many uh, food companies add antioxidants to their product to extend the shelf life and they would have to be obviously fat soluble antioxidants. How about solid fat content? We mentioned we, we mentioned this before and solid fat content is usually measured by a black box NMR. And you'll see this is that black box NMR format. It's, it looks like a shoe box. There's not a lot of uh, information going on. And we've talked about black box technology in this chemistry class. So many of the analytical procedures that are done by food companies are no longer uh, requiring specialty uh, technicians with advanced science degrees. The technology is being designed by engineering firms such that a uh, minimally trained analyst would just put a tube into the product, click a button on a computer, and out comes a result. And so this solid fat content NMR, it's a very expensive device, and so more frequently people will send these um, sorts of tests out for um, analysis in another facility. But if you were, let's say you were Richardson Oilseed, and you were making fat... 24 hours a day, seven days a week, then it may make sense for you to have one of these in-house. So what is it doing? Well, it's doing pulsed NMR, and it's measuring the percent of solid fat directly. And it's it's pulsed, and it emits a signal, and it will tell you the... the uh, and it's, it's also running that product in that very special tube, in an NMR tube, through a temperature cycle. So it's going to ramp up this temperature cycle... Um, periodically and then do an NMR pulse and evaluate the liquid to solid fractions. So that's it for that. As I mentioned, these analytical techniques are very, very different than the analytical techniques that we've seen in some of our other commodities and other um, core ingredients. And that's why I wanted to take some time to just walk you through some of these. And it, um, Always ask more questions. Always, if, if you have some curiosity about some of these techniques, do ask more and uh, research some more and reach out to me because I love to make slideshows that are specific to answer some of your questions that are out there. All right, take care and we will talk to you soon.